Fine. It is 10.37. You're with Double Take until 11 o'clock. Now, tomorrow, London will host the world premiere of Ron Howard's new film, Rush, bringing to the big screen one of the most dramatic and compelling stories in the history of motor racing. Hunt. James Hunt. Who's that? It's Nicky Lauda. He's just been signed by Ferrari. I'm both quicker than you and better at setting up the car. This is an incredible battle between these two drivers. To be a champion, you have to really believe it. You're just a party guy. You're killing us out there. You're too far back. I'm quicker than all of you. And James Hunt is out. It's over, superstar. Today with the rain, it's the most dangerous trick in the world. That all depends on how good you are in the rain. Let's race. Louder, trapped in a searing inferno of 800 plus degrees. I feel responsible for what happened. Watching you win those races, you were equally responsible for getting me back in the car. The showdown between you and Nikki is all anyone wants to see. Mm, the showdown between you and Nikki is all anyone wants to see. Um, and we are very, very lucky because we have said Nikki with us. And just before we talk to Nikki Lauder, let me just tell you the story for those who don't know. Um, just picture this. It's 1976. World champion Nikki Lauder looks odds on to retain his Formula One title with a commanding lead over his rival, the flamboyant Englishman James Hunt. But then there is a terrible, terrible crash at Germany's Nürburgring um, and it leads Lauder fighting for his life. And then miraculously, against all odds, just two months later, he's back in his Ferrari and it goes down to the very last race of the season. Well, I'll leave it at that because you need a cliffhanger to go and watch this and find out more. But it is an extraordinary story. Nicky Lauda, when you look back or when you hear me sort of recite it, um, does it feel real? It is real. It doesn't feel real. It has been real. And for sure, a thing like this you will never forget. And for me, the memories now really come back because I worked together with Peter Morgan, who wrote the script about the movie, and then with Ron Howard to make the movie happen. So the whole thing really came back to me in the last, would say, one and a half years when we worked together to get this movie going. Yeah, it was very charming. I saw Ron Howard talking about the film, saying... I could only have made this because it was a true story, because if it were a fiction, then everyone would say it's beyond plausibility. But because it's real, I can make this movie. He's absolutely right, because um, when we started, uh, when Peter Morgan approached me uh, and he says he wants to write a script about the 76 season, uh, he met me, I don't know, 20 times to make sure the movie is exactly what had happened in that year. And you just mentioned it before. It was a big fight for the championship, but then, unfortunately, I nearly killed myself at the Nürburgring. Yeah, now, um, that was, for those who don't know, a, a horrific crash. I mean, we're used to seeing uh, Formula One cars get knocked about, but this was a different era when if you crashed, you could die. In fact, many, many of your comrade races did die in, in crashes. What do you remember of that terrible, terrible time? I remember of the terrible, terrible time uh, compared to today. Every year out of 18 drivers, at least one got killed, some years two. So you could work out how long it takes before it's your turn. So it was absolutely dangerous. Why? The cars were built out of aluminium. So whenever you hit something, uh, the car smashed and killed you. And the safety on circuits were nowhere near as today. We were driving between narrow guardrails or trees, and we were completely unprotected. Therefore, it was so dangerous. Mm. I heard accounts of, of James Hunt um, actually pulling out one of the races in one of his races from, from a car and, and I mean, practically dying in his arms. And when they got to you at that awful uh, Nürburgring episode, the car's on fire, you are burning. It took them 60 seconds to get you out of the car, which is unthinkable today that it would take so long. Yeah, first of all, the cars would never catch fire today because they're built completely different out of carbon fiber. But in my terrible crash, I was lucky that my car stopped uh, full on fire with 800 degrees in the middle of the circuit. So the drivers had to stop. And there was a guy called Arturo Merzario, 
who jumped into the fire and uh, alone pulled me out of the wreckage. So I survived. So he really saved my life there because a couple of seconds more, I would have never made it. Were you conscious throughout that? I was told to be conscious uh, because I have no memory at all about the whole crash. I saw it in this video, which an eight-year-old boy just took of the accident. And uh, John Watson, for example, was there to, to help me, and he was holding my head. And um, I said, what did I ask you? Because I spoke to him, and he said, uh, I asked him, how do I look or what happened to my face? And then I said to him afterwards, what did you say? And he said, oh, you look absolutely perfect. Nothing happened. Mm. So I've been conscious, but for sure... Uh, this terrible uh, hour or two, I could not remember anything. You, you, you. I mean, you weren't. I mean, despite the reassurances of your friend, you, you really were very, very badly burnt about the face, lost part of your ear, had to undergo uh, extensive uh, operations um, t- to save your sight. Even it was, it was truly awful. But you knew, didn't you? You, you felt there was something wrong about this racetrack even before you raced, didn't you? Try and get the. I've heard that you tried to get the race called off. The problem was that the Nürburgring uh, has been, it, uh, it is, nobody's racing there in Formula 1 today. It's 22 kilometers long, and you can secure this place. It was a real dangerous place. And we drove there before, and we told the organizers to uh, put some guardrails up to make the whole place safer. And they had a three-year program to do that, and they fulfilled it. And before the race in Long Beach, I was the, the driver's spokesman. We sat together in Long Beach, and we drivers discussed can we go there this year because the car's been so much quicker? I, for example, I'm the only one who ran the Nürburgring lap in below one, seven minutes. So there is six minutes, 58 there, which nobody ever did. And the majority of the drivers said, because they've invested all this money, we should race once more and then it's over. Mm. And then I had to agree with the majority of the drivers. And then I nearly killed myself. The, I mean, if if that weren't um, uh, uh, that to most people would be a dramatic end to what what has been a, a hugely dramatic career, but it wasn't for you. And this is what the film does very beautifully. You came back, Nikki, um, and and very very quickly. Um, your lungs were badly damaged by the smoke, and yet there's James Hunt pursuing the title that you felt was yours. What propelled you to get out of bed and say, "No, I'm getting back into the car." Well, first of all, uh, I was realistic enough to know that I am driving in a very dangerous sport. So I was not surprised to have an accident. It sounds a little funny today. Nevertheless, after I was fit, I thought about it. Do you want to come back and see if you first of all can do it? And then simply continue with your passion uh, for driving these racing cars quick. I took the decision to come back and then it was hard work basically to fight fear, to get back in Monza. I couldn't drive on the first day. Then I had to reorganize everything, how to approach the races. And then I continued to race. So I really did, did a good comeback under these conditions. Mm, did, uh, there's a line in the film where uh, James Hunt turns around to you, you or the man playing you, and says, um, I, I feel I'm to blame for what's happened to you, Nikki. And you say, um, you, watching you race got me out of bed watching you race, you, you may feel yourself to blame for my accident, but you're also responsible for me being back in the car. Did, did that conversation really happen? No, that conversation really happened because it came in Monza where I came back. And I'll tell you honestly, when I've, when I've, seen, the, I've seen the film uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I was really shocked when Hunt approaches me in the pits and Daniel Pruill, who plays me, turns around with this burnt face. Because when I had all this happening, I was always upset about people being shocked when they saw me. And I thought, this is not nice. Look in my eyes when you talk to me and don't try to look at my ear and my badly burned face. So I was upset at the time, but after I've seen the movie now, I understand the people because they really look terrible. And then this conversation happened. And uh, at the same time, I agree. I had to go through all this mess. I wanted to come back. And this more competitive hunt was racing. It's harder I tried, and which was good for me because otherwise maybe I would have never made it. 
What um, the the way that the film portrays you both? I mean, it's it's beautifully set up. Here is Hunt with his long flowing locks and his you know sort of slightly irresponsible um, uh, behaviour before races, drinking, smoking, womanising, and and then they portray you as this. I mean, this almost superhuman presence coming back from this terrible crash, but very serious, very pragmatic. Um, are you happy with that portrayal? I must say, uh, I mean, it's a Hollywood movie. Uh, you have to understand that that Hunt was a little, let's say, uh, shown as more as a playboy. He was a playboy. There's no question about it. And I'm shown as the technical driver who is overcoming fear and trying to get back in the car. The principle is absolutely right. I have to agree with Peter Morgan that it was very accurate when you look from the outside into the season. We two different characters really have been like this. Are you a little bit more like Hunt, perhaps? I if mean, you can tell us, I won't tell anybody. I mean, you know, it'll just be between us. Well, between you and me, I was about 30% of Hunt. I would <laughs> say, but because before the race, before the race, I always knew it is much better to go to bed sober and be fit because the danger was really bad. Mm. I'm just trying to do the maths, Nikki. I'll be honest, because they said he had 5,000 notches in his belt from all of his conquests, 30% of that. I'll just leave people to, you know, get out their calculators. Um, j- just just finally, um, do you feel a, r- a little tear at the heart that here you are looking back at this glittering time um, of two lives, but James Hunt isn't? I mean, he died so very young of a heart attack that he doesn't get um, to see this. The most saddest thing tomorrow for me will be that James is not there. Because he would certainly have enjoyed this pleasure, him being in a movie, in his lifestyle, and he would have had a big piss up tomorrow if he would be still here with us. <laughs> Nikki Lauder, it is honestly an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very, very much indeed. Um, the great Nikki Lauder.